Hello, and welcome to the Arabian Nights and its Afterlives, Yasmin Seal in Conversation. I'm Rebecca Ariel Port, a member of the core faculty here at the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research. And we are very, very pleased to have with us Yasmin Seal, the translator of the Annotated Arabian Nights, which is just out from Norton, and my colleague Ajay Singh Chavri, both of whom I'll introduce more formally in, in just a moment. Our topic of discussion will be the chimerical collection of tales that goes by the name Alf Layla Walayla, the Thousand and One Nights, or as it's often mistranslated, the Arabian Nights. And Yasmin's monumental translations of this luxurious and complicated text will be the matter of the evening. And she'll be reading uh, for, from those in just a, a few minutes, evening and afternoon. It's evening for, for Yasmin, I think. So we'll follow this with a conversation uh, involving all three of, of the, the people collected here, and a Q&A um, that, uh, that will uh, involve you, the audience. So please do comment with your questions, and we'll try to save some time at the end to answer them. Before I hand things over to Yasmin, I want to set the stage for her reading with a few brief pieces of context important to the Knights. Collection of fantastical stories, Arabic with roots in India and Persia, the Knights is dreamlike in many ways, beginning with the famous frame narrative in which Shahrazad, married to the embittered murderous Sultan Shariar, spins out each night a thread of nested stories, each promising another tale to come. Enthralled by her storytelling, Shariar lets her live another night and another and another to prolong the delicious suspense. The work of many hands, the knights changes shape over time, accruing new stories, losing some details and gaining others as it is altered by oral retellings and new transcriptions, collations and additions in the cosmopolitan cities of the Muslim world. Not to mention the translations, retranslations and adaptations in Europe, Africa and Latin America. Its influence is everywhere from Boccaccio and Burton to Christina Rossetti, James Joyce, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, Wale Sayinka and Naguib Mahfouz. Related to the Arabic Aja'ab, stories of astonishing things, the Nights is narratively complex, full of stories within stories, divigations, and sly jokes. Written in Middle Arabic, halfway between classical and popular idioms, the Nights is marginal to the classical Arabic literary canon, a set of stories without an author, a fleeting entertainment for women and children, a mirror for merchants designed to appeal to popular audiences in the bustling urban centers of the Arab world. Because it's circulated so widely beyond this world, it has assumed an outsized importance beyond it, where it has become a part of vernacular culture and literary tradition alike, and a key source in many of the distortions of Orientalism, but also an influence in its own right. The challenges of translating this notoriously equivocal text are enormous, and we'll talk about a few of them after Yasmin's reading. But for now, I'd like to introduce our other participants um, who, who both have good stories to tell. Yasmin Seal is a writer and translator living in Paris. Her essays, poetry, visual art, and translations from Arabic and French have appeared widely in Harper's, The Paris Review, Freeze, The Times Literary Supplement, and other publications, as well as many books and anthologies. Her work has received a Pan America Literary Grant and the Wasafiri New Writing Prize for Poetry. Her translation of Aladdin came out with Norton in 2018, and she has since been embarked on a new translation of 1001 Nights for the same publisher. Part of this work features in the annotated Arabian Nights, which is out now. Current and forthcoming projects include translations of the poetry of Al Hansa and Agitated Air, co-written with Robin Moger, a collection of poems in response to Ibn Arabi. Ajay Singh Chowdhury is the executive director of the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research and a core faculty member specializing in social and political theory. He holds a PhD from Columbia University, uh, a master's from the London School of Economics and has written for a variety of publications, including The Guardian, The Nation, The Baffler, and Plus One, Los Angeles Review of Books, Court, Social Text, Dialectical Anthropology, The Hedgehog Review, Filmmaker Magazine, and Three Quirks Daily, among others. So um, Yasmin, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Um, I know that uh, you have uh, some selections to read for us from, from the Knights. Um, so please go ahead whenever you're ready. 
thank you so much, Rebecca. And that was such a good introduction to the Knights. I may just steal that. That was such a good encapsulation of the whole thing. Um, I, uh, I have a couple of things to read, one short and one longer. I'm gonna read one complete story. Um, but before that, I thought I would just read a few lines from the frame tale. Um, you very beautifully introduced the, the conceit of the whole work, which is um, the story of Shahrazad um, telling stories every night to this murderous misogynistic king who has decided to, um, uh, to, to, to kill every woman he sleeps with uh, in the morning um, so that he may never be betrayed. Um, and Shahrazad's gamble is to play for time by, um, by, by coming up with stories every night. Um, th that story, that conceit is rather well known, um, but I wonder how many people um, have actually read the description of Shahrazad. She only exists in a few words in the frame tale and everything else is her own words, the stories that she tells. Um, but I thought it might be interesting to just read the, the actual description of this character because it's rather unusual and rather unlike descriptions of other female characters in the story. Um, and uh, I'll read it also because I think she is, a, uh, the, the story that I will read later presents a kind of parallel scenario to Shahrazad's own plight. Um, so as you said, she uh, has volunteered to marry um, King Shahriyar, um, who has ordered his vizier or, or minister, if you like, to, um, to kill all of these women um, who, who pass through his, his bedchamber every night. Um, now, the vizier who had the women murdered had two daughters of his own, the elder Shahrazad and the younger Dunyazad. Shahrazad had read a lot of books science and philosophy, knew poetry by heart, had studied history and myth and the wisdom of kings, and she was practiced at clear thinking and full feeling and close reading. And one day she said to her father, let me tell you what is on my mind. What is it? I want you to marry me to Shahriyar so that I may liberate my people or die trying. Foolish child, he said, do you not know that Shahriyar spends only one night with his wife and kills her in the morning? If I give you to him, he will sleep with you and have you killed, and I will have to do it. Let him kill me. Why put yourself in danger? I have made my choice, said Shahrazad. And her father, furious, said, my girl, those who throw caution to the wind end up in dust. I worry that what happened to the donkey and the ox will happen to you. What happened to them, father? And he said, and then the father tells um, two stories, two interlaced stories, um, which are the only stories in the nights that are not told by Shahrazad, but by her father. And they're rather bad stories. Um, and in fact, the stories end with Shahrazad saying, these stories don't impress me. And they're both stories about one of them is about an, a donkey teaching an ox how to go on strike and it ends badly. Um, so it's a, a story about being crafty in the face of oppression or enslavement and failing. Um, and the second story is about a, a woman who's beaten into submission by her husband. Um, so they're both stories about how one, one should not, um, one should not try and, and, and be sort of crafty or um, try and escape one's, one's oppression or one's difficult situation. Um, those, are the, those are the lessons that those stories are trying to um, impart to Shahrazad who disregards them and, um, and says, no, I, I will go and, and I want you to, to take me to the king. Um, uh, should I go straight into the, the longer story? Is that all right? Um, this, is a, this is a story um, which is one of the so-called ransom stories uh, in which stories are told precisely to change someone's mind and to save one's own life, um, to show that the, the cruelties of, of powerful people need to be reconsidered. Um, it's a story that's nested within the cycle of the fisherman and the jinn, 
And this is one of the stories told by the fisherman to the jinn in order to buy himself time um, because the jinn wants to kill him. Um, and I have chosen it because it exemplifies what I think of as the knight's, um, what Orhan Pamuk, I think, called the knight's secret internal geometry. It has a kind of perfect structure, which is uh, which can't be said for all the stories in the knights. Um, and I also like it because it contains a poem recited by a severed head. The tale of King Yunnan and the wise Duban. Know, Jin, that there was in a city of Persia, in the land of Zuman, a king named Yunnan who suffered from leprosy and whom the doctors and the sages could not cure, though they plied him with potions and rubbed him with balms. One day there came to the city a wise man named Duban, a doctor who had read all sorts of books, Greek and Persian and Arabic and Latin and Syriac and Hebrew, and had studied the learning they contained and the principles they rested on and had tried their theories and their uses. And he knew about the properties of plants and herbs, the harmful and the healthy, and he knew philosophy and all the sciences. It was days into his stay when wise Duban heard talk of King Yunnan and the disease no doctor could cure. When God's morning broke, he put on his best clothes and went to see the king. He introduced himself and said, I hear majesty of the sickness in your body and the failure of your scholars, and I have come to treat you, but not a drop shall pass your lips nor touch your skin. If you heal me, said the king, your children's children will be rich and I will give you favors and you will sit with me and share my table. And the king gave him robes of honor and was kind. Can you really cure me without drugs or balm? I will cure you, said the doctor, from a distance. The king was astonished and in his heart was love and awe for the wise man. Be quick, he said, and do what you have promised. The doctor said, I will. He went into the city where he took a house, unpacked his medicines and set about distilling cures. He fashioned a mallet, hollowed it and filled the handle hollow too with balms and remedies. And he made the mallet excellently and he also carved a ball with perfect skill. When all this was done, he waited until morning, went to see the king and kissed the ground before him. The wise Duban proposed they ride out to the race course for a game. With his lords and princes and viziers, the king rode out. And when they took their seats, the doctor offered him the mallet and said, take this mallet, grip it tightly in your palm and race around the field, striking the ball. When you sweat, the remedy will seep into your palms and permeate your body. And when you have sweated enough and taken in the cure, go home and have a bath and sleep you will wake up cured. King Yunnan, mallet in hand, mounted his horse. And when the bull was thrown, he galloped after it and struck it hard, the handle still in his grasp. He rode without relief until his palms began to sweat and his body drank the medicine in the handle and it began to flow inside his frame. When the doctor knew the drug had entered the king's body, he sent him home into the bath. And when the king had washed with care, he dressed and went back to his palace and to sleep. As for the wise Duban, he spent the night at home and early the next day, he asked to see the king. When he was admitted, he went in and kissed the ground before him and the king rose and embraced him. He seated the doctor beside him and gave him his attention, smiles and honor and all sorts of gifts. For when the king had looked at his body after the bath, he found no trace of leprosy and his skin was clear as silver. He was pleased and breathed more easily. In the morning, the king returned to his diwan and took his seat surrounded by attendants and viziers. When the wise Duban appeared, the king stood to embrace him and seated him beside him. And like friends, they drank and ate together. When night fell, the king gave the doctor a thousand dinars and sent him home. He marveled at the doctor's skill and thought, he cured me from a distance, no drinking and no rubbing. And for his skill, he must have every honor and reward. <laughs>
he will share my table, have my ear and be my friend. The king passed the night delighting in his body, healed and healthy. And when morning came and it was light, the king returned to his diwan and from his throne called for the doctor. When the doctor came and kissed the ground before him, the king stood up to greet him, seated the doctor beside him and let him share his food and held him close and showered him with gifts. They kept up their conversation until evening when the doctor was sent home, another thousand dinars in his pocket. And with his wife, he spent the night pleased and full of thanks for what the king had given him. When day broke again, the king went back to his diwan, surrounded by his princes and attendants and viziers. Now one of these viziers was sour and mean and full of hate. And when he saw the doctor had found favor with the king and saw the wealth and standing he had gained, he feared that he would be dismissed, replaced, and he resented him and wished him harm. Envy touches every man. This vizier approached the king, kissed the ground before him and said, Majesty, our great and noble king, I grew up in the fold of your favor and grace, and I come to you now with advice. If I hid it, I would be remiss, but command me to reveal it and I will. The king, annoyed, said, what advice? Heed the consequences or see fortune turn against you. Your majesty has strayed in lending your ear to your enemy, in taking for your confidant and showering with gifts a man come to destroy you. I fear that he will do you harm. The king said, who is it you accuse? Whom do you mean? Where do you point your finger? If you were asleep, said the vizier, wake up. I point the finger at the wise Duban, come from Byzantium. Is he my enemy? He is the truest man, the dearest and the finest in my eye because he cured me with a thing I only had to hold and he relieved me of the sickness that defied the doctors. There is no one like him in the world, east or west, near or far, and you say this about him. From today, I will give him every month a thousand dinars as well as salary and benefits. If I were to share with him my kingdom and my wealth, it would be far less than he deserves. Envy for the wise Duban has entered you, Vizier, and you want me to kill him and I will regret it, just as King Sinbad regretted killing his falcon. The Vizier said, what is his story? And the King told it to him. Now I'm going to skip the story of King Sinbad and the falcon, which is very sad. Um, and, um, the, the king then responds to the vizier with a, with a story of his own, which is a common feature in the nights. You get these kind of dueling narratives um, where people sort of throw stories at each other. Um, so the king responds with a story about a prince and a ghoul, um, and then back to the, to the main story. And you, majesty, said the envious vizier, if you put your trust in this wise man, he will destroy you. He is a foreign agent come to bring you down. Do you not see that he cured you from a distance simply by giving you something to hold? You are right, said the king, it must be as you say. If he has cured me with something to hold, he may well kill me with something to smell. What should I do with him? Send for him now, said the vizier, and when he comes, strike off his head and you shall have your safety. The king said, this is good advice. He sent for Duban, who arrived still full of joy at all the honor, gifts and favors that were his. He motioned to the king and said these lines. And here Duban recites a, a poem of praise for the king, completely oblivious to what's about to happen. The king said, do you know why I have brought you here? The wise Duban said, no, I have brought you here to take away your life. Duban was astonished and said, kill me, majesty, and for what crime? I have been told, said the king, you are a spy come to kill me, but I will kill you first. You want me for your dinner, but I'll have you for lunch. He called the executioner and said, strike off this wise man's head and rid me of his harm. Strike. At these words, the wise man understood he had been envied for his favor with the king 
and that somebody had lied to have him killed. He knew the king had little sense or wisdom and he regretted what was too late to regret. There is no power and no strength except in God, he said. I did a good thing and was paid with spite. And the king was shouting, strike. Spare me, the wise man said, and God will spare you, but kill me and be killed. Then King Yunnan said to the wise Duban, I have to kill you for you cured me with a king, with a thing I only had to hold and I fear you could kill me with anything. Is this my reward, the wise man said, cruelty for care. And the king said, you must die today. When the wise man knew his death was near, he wept and blamed himself for doing good to people who were not and for sowing seeds in barren soil. He said these lines, Maimuna has an empty head, though born to a wise father. And if they call you brother, keep your wits. And if you walk the earth, prepare to slip. Then the executioner came near and bound the wise man's weeping eyes and drew his sword. Is this my reward? The wise man said. It is like the reward of the crocodile. What, said the king, is the story of the crocodile? I am in no condition to tell you a story, said the wise man, but I beg you, spare me and God will spare you, but kill me and be killed, and be killed. And he wept heavy tears. Then a few of the king's noblemen stood up and said, Majesty, spare him for our sake, he has done nothing wrong. You do not know, said the king, why I must kill him. If I were to spare him, I would die myself for he has cured me from a distance of an illness that defied the doctors, and he did so with a thing I only had to hold. I cannot be sure he will not kill me with the same device. I must kill him to be safe. And when the wise Duban was sure his end had come, he said, Majesty, delay my death a little. Allow me time to return home. Leave instructions for my burial fulfill my obligations and give alms and donate my books on medicine and science to a deserving home. In particular, I have a book, rarest of the rare, I want to give to you to keep among your treasures. What makes the book so rare? asked the king. Its wonders are not to be counted, said Duban, but the first of its secrets is this. If you, majesty, cut off my head and open the book at the sixth page, and read three lines from the left page and speak to me, my head will speak to you and answer what you ask. The king was amazed. Do you mean, he said, that if I cut your head off, open the book and read the lines you say and speak to your head, it will speak back? Nothing could be stranger. He sent the wise man home with guards to settle his affairs. And on the following day, he returned to the court and so too did the princes and viziers. Then the wise Duban arrived and in his hands were an old book and a coal jar containing powder. He sat down, sent for a tray, poured out the powder, spread it and said to the king, take this book majesty and do not open it until I die. Then have my head placed on the tray and pressed into the powder. This will stanch the blood. Open the book, address your questions to my head and it will answer back. I have to kill you, said the king, if only to, to see your head speak. He took the book and told the executioner to cut off the wise man's head. He drew the sword and with a single stroke, dropped the head into the tray and pressed it in the powder and the bleeding stopped. Then the wise Duban opened his eyes and said, now, Majesty, open the book. When the king opened the book, he found the pages stuck. He put his finger to his mouth and wet it with saliva and turned to the first page. And in the same effortful way, he turned page after page. And when he had turned seven and found nothing written, he said, Duban, I cannot see a written word inside this book. Keep turning, said Duban. The king turned more pages and found nothing, but the book was laced with poison, and as he licked and turned, the drug entered his body, and he began to sway and heave and shake 
When the wise Duban saw that the king began to sway and shake, he said these lines. Their reign was long and cruel, and in a moment gone. Had justice been their rule, justice would be done. But they, brutal in power, have met a brutal end, and wake to hear the hour crowing its revenge. As the wise man's head finished these lines, the king fell dead. Then the head died too. Thank you. Um, that was beautiful uh, and beautifully read as well. Um, I see what you mean about the, the sort of perfect geometries of, of that story. Maybe we'll have a chance to, to talk about why it's so geometrically perfect, formally speaking, and in just a minute. Um, but I, I wanted to, to maybe start our, our conversation by, by asking how you came to the Knights is the project of long standing for you and you're continuing to, to translate many of the, the stories not included in, in the annotated Arabian Nights. Mm. Um, this was something I was commissioned to do. I didn't choose this project. Um, uh, and in fact, I had very little relationship with this work. Um, I don't think I'd actually read it uh, before I was asked to translate it. Um, it began as a as a rather contained commission, um, Paolo Horta, who um, edited the, the annotated edition, um, had been uh, asked by, by Norton to prepare a new um, annotated edition of the Knights. And initially he'd commissioned me to translate only those stories which were first published in French. Um, so just to kind of uh, give a bit of context, because this is um, quite a sort of surprising um, story in the history of the Knights, uh, many of the stories that are thought to be, um, that are most closely associated with this work and that have become some of the most iconic stories um, associated with the Knights were in fact uh, first written down in 18th century France in French and, and have no Arabic um, manuscript. Uh, these are stories like Aladdin, Ali Baba, The Enchanted Horse, um, and we can, it's a whole fascinating story and maybe we can sort of come back to that. Um, but I had initially um, been commissioned only to translate those, those stories. So th these were translations from 18th century French rather than from Arabic. Um, and that initial commission then mushroomed a bit like the Knights itself <laughs> um, grew and, and, and kept sort of uh, accreting um, until it became uh, a much larger commission with directly with the publisher to, um, to, do, to produce a, a complete translation of The Thousand and One Nights, which is a kind of impossible um, contract. <laughs> you know, it's, it's very hard to say what that means, what the complete nights actually looks like, how many stories there are. As you said in your introduction, it's such a slippery object um, whose edges are completely undefined. Uh, nobody can say, you know, what the nights really is or where its edges are, how many stories there are, which of the stories are authentic. Um, it's, a, it's a collection really, rather than a one text that has continued to grow over a thousand years. So I'm somewhere in the middle of this very long standing um, project, which um, began about three years ago, I think. And um, I'm due to deliver the complete nights in a couple of years. So the annotated edition, which is published now, um, is a kind of midway point and features um, a number of stories which are, if you like, the most, um, the greatest hits, you know, the kind of, um, some of the kind of key Arabic stories and also the, uh, the French stories. Yeah, oh, wonderful. Um, yeah, I mean, it strikes me that, that um, you know, you, you've read a story that is also kind of, um, uh, meta literary in a sense too, right? Because it's you know the magical object is is this book um, that um, that seems to have only blank pages, right? And thus it is both um, you know uncharted possibility um, and and also kind of dead in the sense of of narrative, right? Um, or one ha would have to read it with some other expectation besides besides narrative. Um, and 
in a way, that's that's about the nights itself, right? Or or has become to be about the the sort of reception and transmission of of the nights, right? It is sort of um, the infinite book in in that sense, right? right. Um, and that it has no no end or boundaries, and it's always being revised and added to. Um, and it's so unstable, right? Um, and so full of of difficulties for that reason, just in the selection process and in the text. Um, as you said, um, many of the greatest hits are here. Um, what are the greatest challenges when you actually think about kind of approaching the, the process of, of translation here? You know, what are your sorts of values as a translator when you when you think about how to how to work on the nights, whether you're translating right the the Galan stories, right? The, the 18th century French ones, um, or whether you're thinking about um, Hannah Diab, who's also a really important figure in this in this story we could talk about, um, or these stories that, that are essentially authorless, uh, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, the first difficulty in translating a, a work that lacks an authoritative text, that lacks a, a, a stable corpus, is um, our, our editorial challenges. Um, you know, it's it's up to the translator to um, to, to snip and sew and and sort of make all these decisions about which um, which stories to include, which to leave out. Um, uh, and I didn't really make those decisions with this volume. That was really kind of Paolo's remit. Um, but we did we did in 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 some parts of the text sort of have to make little adjustments. Um, uh, you know, there are all kinds of continuity issues and um, so much repetition. And then that's. I mean, this is maybe a kind of separate challenge, you know, how do you deal with a work that in which repetition and formula is such a is such an integral part of the work. Um, it would be uh, absurd to try and avoid repetition entirely in the nights because it's it's so crucial to the to the kind of beauty and the structure of the work. But at the same time, these are these are stories that um, you know, in some cases, uh, grew through being told and, and were not always kind of in the bounds of a book. And so when your challenge is to produce one book, you know, a volume, something that can be held within two covers, um, there, there are all kinds of questions about, well, how much of that, you know, do you leave in? And also the, the kind of uh, more structural question, I suppose, of um, which, which stories to include, because um, the history of the nights is one in which um, editors have and, and, and compilers and translators have competed with each other to produce the most authoritative collection, the longest, the most complete. And often this involved a kind of arms race where people were sort of stuffing their collections with ever more stories in order to show that theirs was um, the most authentic one, um, which had the consequence of lots of stories being added that often weren't very good <laughs> or that were simply there to, to act as, as, as filler. Um, so then the question for us today is, well, you know, should we continue to tell those stories just because someone at some point made them part of the night? Um, or should we be thinking critically perhaps about which stories we want to continue to tell? And I see my task as really that of giving an account of the journey of this work without, um, without really trying to be exhaustive because I don't think completeness is possible. Um, but, uh, but I would like to give a sense of the kind of archeology span of this work and the way it's evolved and, and grown through time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this sense of kind of um, also the way that, um, you know, that these stories sort of show the history if you will, right? Um, that you know, it's it's not that they kind of exist in this timeless space. I mean, history is sort of erupting into them all the time in various ways, whether it's sort of um, this cosmopolitan world of, of kind of urban um, medieval Baghdad, right? Which is which is all over, um, or whether it is. Um, simply write a, a story that it, you know is probably invented and then added in a specific time period right that, that sort of um bears the the marks of that i mean i think that yeah like one has to kind of tell the story of the knights um through translation right i mean translation arguably always has that that kind of flavor of narrative construction but um um but yeah i mean it seems to me that um you know there are so many different stories in here that seem to me to um, 
you know, be richer and 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 more meaningful kind of within the historical context in as much as we can we can know it, right? Whether they're kind of allegorizing or satirizing some political situation that's going on at the time um, or some social condition um, that that is being displayed, right? And, and it's not that the, the magical objects and the Ginny and everything are, are just set dressing. I mean, they're obviously really integral parts of, of how it works. Um, but at the same time, uh, they're really, um, also, uh, you know, lending themselves to, to kind of all sorts of um, symbolic readings, right, um, all through the, the text. Um, and I'm really wondering, um, you know, you know, are there stories in, in the nights that you think are particularly kind of aesthetically interesting or, or interesting for kind of political or poetic reasons or any that you just have a sort of irrational fondness for um, or maybe a rational one, who knows? <laughs> um. Oh, there's so much in what you've said. Um, I mean, I love this idea of the knights showing its history. Um, and I do think you're right that they are a kind of, the knights are a kind of archive, a sort of strange, um, chaotic archive, but they do, they're a, it's, a, it's a work with memory. Um, and maybe, maybe one kind of digression we could make here is to go back to this description of Shahrazad. Um, that I wanted to read from because what I find so striking in that passage is that she's not described physically. She's not an embodied character, um, which is almost unique. Um, I mean, every, every character we encounter in the nights is pretty much is described in some way and is often described in terms of their beauty. And the text often moves into another kind of register to describe their beauty. There's this wonderful um, sort of poetic prose uh, in Arabic called Seja, which is a special kind of register where the text breaks into a more kind of rhythmic musical style. Um, so it's often very sort of noticeable when a character is introduced because the, the text changes. With Shahrazad, all we know about her is um, what she's read and remembered. She is a kind of memory or she's a kind of library. Um, and uh, and so I think of her as a sort of authorial figure in that way. Um, and she's a very striking kind of author because she doesn't invent stories really. What she does is remember material that she's read and, and, and give it new expression. So it's a kind of principle of recombination rather than of originality, um, which, is a, which is an interesting kind of model for literature that this is all kind of material that's just endlessly being recycled and retold and misremembered. Um, and the Knights itself as a work is a bit like that. It's a kind of container, <laughs> as you said, a sort of empty book in which it's a kind of sack into which all of these um, stories from different literary traditions can be, can be thrown and as a result can be preserved um, by being paradoxically by being changed and adapted and, and um, sort of misremembered. Um, but also the night is quite, quite literally an archive in that um, in, in the story I read, there are a couple of poems. Um, the nights contains a huge amount of poetry and often these are real poems. You know, these are poems by real poets um, from whenever these stories were, were compiled. Um, which in many cases are otherwise lost to us. Um, so the Knights became this, this kind of place for embedding um, other works that, that would, would otherwise be inaccessible. Um, so there's, the, the Knights represents this kind of principle, I think, of, of preservation, which is not to do with keeping something the same, but actually but, but that it's about um, preserving something through uh, unruliness <laughs> and, and change. Unruliness and, um, and improvisation. Um, I mean, I, I loved your description, right, of, 
of Shahrazad as a as a close reader, right? Um, which you know maybe that's just kind of my my literary background speaking, and I don't know what the original was for that, um, which I'd be curious to know. Um, but it's so fascinating to me um, that the kind of account you just gave us of Shahrazad as a as a library, right? Um, a figure kind of almost um, equivalent to to I don't know Homer, right? And the in the Iliad and the Odyssey, um, somebody who um, can be inhabited um, in a sense by subsequent stories tellers because this has a, a literary tradition, a written tradition, and also um, an oral tradition, right? And, and the storyteller um, as a figure, and I think we'll hear a bit more about the Benjaminian version of this in, in just a, a few minutes when we invite Jay back on. Um, but is this is this figure, um, right, who in a way, um, and, and I suppose this is maybe a little um, a little Keatsian of me or something, but right, is, is the sort of chameleon poet, right? Who stands in perpetually for other objects, right? The sun, the moon and, and men and women. Um, and so, you know, it does become this really, really interesting uh, sort of instrument almost, right? Um, for the rhapsodist, right? Which was what, um, you know, reciters of, of the, the Iliad and the Odyssey came to be called eventually, right? Um, for the rhapsodist to sort of um, both preserve and, and also to embroider in keeping with the present, right? To, it, to sort of adapt it or massage it for the needs of the immediate um, audience of the the oral tale. Um, so I love the idea that you've you've almost kind of in translating this, um, you know, entered into that kind of rhapsodic tradition. I'm not sure what the, what the equivalent would be in in the Arabic, but um, uh, but it's really marvelous. Um, and I and I think maybe before we invite a Jay in, um, who will have excellent things to say as well, um, I just want to. Um, to end with a with a question about um, uh, yeah, a poetry, right? Um, which you know, there's so much interpolated I'm poetry. Sorry, Rebecca, all through this. I've lost you. Oh gosh, um, can you hear me now? I can. Yeah. Can Could you hear you me now? The last twenty seconds yeah. again. Yeah, so I'll turn off my, my camera for just a moment to make sure I'm clear. Um, so yeah, um, so I, I, um, I'm really, really interested in, um, in the way that there's so much interpolated poetry in, in the nights. Um, I'm particularly fond of a, of a story that's not actually in here called The City of Iram, which we may or may not talk about it at some point. Um, but I'm really curious because you're a poet yourself about how the nights has informed your poetic practice. You've, you've responded to it in, in various ways, um, both visually and, and poetically, I believe. Mm. Um, it's a good question. It's a, it's a slightly uncomfortable question because I think mm. my responses to it have been to do with my um, ambivalent feelings towards it as, as a work. And um, in a way, they've been a way of expressing um, the more sort of difficult feelings I have towards the work that as, as the translator, I'm not really allowed to express, you know, mm. the work of the translator is one of, um, nowadays at least, is one of um, deference to a text. And, yeah, and, you know, deference, fidelity. You serve it. Um, and, uh, and the Nights is often a text I, I don't want to serve. <laughs> I want to yeah. do other things to it, um, you know, speak back to it or rewrite it. And it's an interesting thing, you know, the um, the kind of publicity material around this often, you know, mentions that I'm I'm the first woman to translate the nights into English, mm. um, which is always a kind of I find it uncomfortable for different reasons. But one of them is that, um, well, what do we mean by translate? Um, you know, plenty of women have uh, adapted these stories and retold them. Um, and so if, if by translation, we mean, you know, faithfully sort of transmitting the content of these stories, then yes, maybe in some narrow sense, but actually um, women have tended to be more sort of irreverent transmitters of this work and more kind of um, more critical readers of it in a way. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a sort of curious position to be in to sort of enter this kind of masculine dynasty of people who've um, reverently passed on <laughs> what they were because <laughs> um, I'm not sure that's the appropriate response to it yeah. um, so as you said in my own um, practice I've uh, I don't think it's an accident that I've sort of um, uh, at the same time you know at the same in the same kind of uh, 
period of time that I've been translating this work, I've also been destroying it in various ways, um, particularly uh, visually. So I think the, the project you re referred to is one in which I'm uh, sort of cutting up a previous translation um, by Edward Lane, who um, produced quite an eccentric translation in the 19th century, removing all the erotic content and um, and adding many, many sort of detailed notes, um, explaining aspects of the text with reference to his own observations of Egyptian, 19th century Egyptian society. Um, so I, I suppose I found that I was having all kinds of um, infuriated feelings, both about the work and about its previous translators and that um, expressing these ideas visually was both, um, more efficient <laughs> and um, and um, and and was sort of giving voice to something that I wasn't really able to do with language. Um, you know, taking scissors to a text is quite an efficient form of critique. <laughs> um, so so yeah, as you say, there's been this kind of um, double-headed side where you know, in some capacity, I'm sort of representing the nights and keeping it alive. Um, but at the same time, I'm, I'm not always sure it's a text that ought to be kept alive in the way that it is, you know, and or rather kept in the kind of status that it has um, in the West. Um, and that this is also to do with the history of the history of the text and its reception. Um, it's really the translation of the nights into French in the 18th century and from French into pretty much every other language that enshrined this text in world literature and that gave it the status it has today. A status it hadn't had within Arabic letters. It was not considered a great piece of literature. There are many, many great sort of masterworks of Arabic literature of, of that period and before it, um, but the Knights was not really one of them. As you said, it was, it was pulp fiction for merchants. Um, but in Europe, it acquired the status as the kind of archetypal work of Arabic literature, um, which I think is something many, many Arabs still feel sort of uncomfortable about. There's even sometimes a perception that it's not really a work of Arabic literature. Um, it's something else. So it's, you know, translating it and being sort of part Arab myself, I often, I have a sort of uncomfortable, you know, a sort of ambivalence about it. And, um, and uh, my own practice has been a way of evacuating that. <laughs> yeah, oh, I mean, I'm glad you have such recourse. Um, and also, um, I mean, I think that, you know, that is a salutary thing, right? To remain critical of, of that with which we are involved and, and not to look away from um, the, the kind of difficulties that, that it encodes. Um, I mean, certainly, um, uh, that is the the challenge, I think, um, often of um, of uh, excavating any text that has become, in some sense, right, um, woven into the culture, right, if not if not canonical in a kind of universally distributed way. Um, so, um, all that's to say, I'm sorry for having asked an uncomfortable question, but this oh. is the place for ambivalence, right? I mean, I think I would be more suspicious if there were no ambivalence about um, this demonstrably kind of you know, I mean, it's a difficult work in the sense of, of, of there are, are, are moral and ethical questions that it poses, right? There are questions about patriarchy, there are questions about class, there are questions about um, memory, as you say. So um, I think on that note, um, I, I want to welcome back uh, Ajay Singh Chaudhary, um, who will have things to say about almost all those things, I am, I am almost certain. So Ajay, hi. Hi, Rebecca, and hello again, Yasmin. Um, and thank you so much for the reading and uh, for all your work that you've put into this edition. Uh, ambivalence is one way or the other. Um, and, you know, Rebecca sort of set me up, I suppose. Uh, you know, and, you know, our colleague, uh, Suzanne Schneider, couldn't make it today. Uh, and she, but she and I both sort of jumped uh, a bit when Rebecca suggested um, this whole event. Um, we both uh, come out of, you know, uh, temporary, both doing a lot, a lot of uh, different work, um, but coming out of uh, Middle East, South Asian, and African and African Studies Department, um, 
And uh, uh, Susie, uh, more in the Arabic literature and Arabic history tradition, and myself, uh, you know, this is like feels like a long time ago. I haven't like pronounced Persian words in a long time, but out of more Persian um, and uh, and sort of that side of the world, and you know, at, sort of sort of jumped at it at first, and then was like, oh wait a minute. I don't really know much about the Arabian Nights at all. Uh, but then, you know, as I started plugging through the introduction and the stories, I was like, oh, wait a minute, I totally do. Um, I have seen these stories, obviously read them, uh, rewritten, adapted, just as Yasmin has suggested, right? And it's, it's not only, right? I think in the introduction, like Coleridge is mentioned and things like this, right? You know, sort of these famous figures of European romanticism. But of course, actually uh, Arabic literature that I have read, uh, contemporary Arabic literature, um, uh, and also, um, sort of uh, the early realists, like novels and, and things like this, like Austin and things of, of this nature, right? It's a very, you're like, wait a minute, I totally do know this. Um, and something about that open-ended uh, approach to storytelling, uh, you know, there were sort of two tracks. I suppose Rebecca has gone down the translation one. Uh, and I, I, I was like fearful. I was like, oh, should I go down the translation track or the storytelling track? But Rebecca, you covered the translation track so well. So I'll go down the storytelling one, right? Um, which is that like, and I, I love this concept and I never heard it before. I, I have encountered the literature called Mirrors for Princes, you know, a billion times, right? And there's a, even like a rich literature that debates whether, you know, something like Machiavelli is in fact a European adaptation of, you know, Mediterranean, uh, North African, Middle Eastern um, sort of versions of Mirrors for Princes, right? These are these sort of like, Right, uh, yeah, like instruction manuals, like you know, for you know how to be a better king, right? Um, and I never encountered this phrase "mirrors for merchants" until this text, and I was like, right, uh, this is so much, and I mean this in the sort of, I suppose, in the good and the bad way. Uh, it is, in fact, a version, or it feels so close to a version of that literature for that is bourgeois, right? Or is like proto-bourgeois or something like that, right? Um, and it does not surprise me, right? That it is picked up uh, and proliferated in 18th and 19th century France and Britain and places like that, right? Um, where um, those kinds of stories to those kinds of audiences uh, would perhaps be more uh, received with the ascendancy of that kind of uh, class. Um, and so I was, I was sort of thinking about all these things and also about, um, as you mentioned, like, and I'm so happy you, you, st you chose this story. Uh, I was rereading um, the uh, King Yunnan and the Wise Dur uh, Duban, I want to say Durban every time, um, this morning, side by side with Aladdin. Um, because I was just like, wait, how, you know, how different, was, you know, and like, you know, I, I, I was poking through the whole thing at, you know, over the past many uh, days. And then this morning was sort of side by side and just make sure I was right. I was like, yes, they are obviously quite different. <laughs> uh, you can feel the fingerprints of, of the French sort of uh, writers. Um, but weirdly, right, you also get this sort of strange, again, I'll, we'll use that phrase ambivalence, where, you know, uh, as the introductory and conclusion and concluding material in this edition sort of, you know, I think it yeah, takes pains to sort of point out, um, there are fingerprints and of, of contemporary Turkish and Arabic and Persian and other sources that are being transmitted into this, into this sort of 18th century French universe, right? Um, and then being adapted, right? Uh, then I guess th this is what uh, Rebecca, I think was referring to with the Diab material, but Rebecca, you can feel free to pick up on that as you see fit. Um, quite literally both by French authors, but also to the sort of, right, like part of the, um, part of the description, right, of, of kings and viziers and stuff um, that is coming out of Diab, at least if we, if we understand the scholarship to be correct, uh, is, is a satire or a criticism of the palace of Versailles, <laughs> uh, not of the palace of, you know, whatever, uh, of Baghdad, right? So, uh, right, and, and, one of the tensions that comes through uh, so clearly uh, in these different adaptations is uh, in the sort of political intensity, and you've mentioned this both sort of in the grain and also against the grain, that the, uh, in the, especially in, in these, in the, we'll call them Islamicate or something like that, Islamic versions, right? Um, that are very focused on this sort of 
just and unjust rulers, um, uh, power structures. And I want to come back to, you use these wonderful words. Uh, yeah, I wrote them down, they're quotes, right? Gambles and plays for time and things like this, that Shahrazad or, or Shahrazad, right, is doing, right? Um, which I'm going to come back to in a moment, right? Um, but that there is this, these are intensely political. And that one of the things that happens in the Europeanized versions, at least the ones that aren't sort of What's the word? Translated in the way you were just discussing, right? That, that uh, you know, that it aren't direct translations. Try to turn them into like moral tales uh, or, or tales of, of sort of simple, like good, you know, bringing out the good that is inherent in people or like, you know, how you can get by as, as a, you know, a sort of, there's much rags to riches in the original material, but then this sort of very Protestantized, if I might be so bold version of sort of like if if you work hard enough you you will be rewarded uh, which is quite alien it seems like uh to to much of the rest of the text so um all of that uh as the sort of introduction to maybe three ideas that i i hope maybe just throw on the table and that could contribute to our discussion um the first is a sort of formal quality that the knights has and that i think you guys have already talked about um I'm not actually, I was, you know, I won't actually try to read from, from Benjamin, but yes, I am adapting many of these from uh, Benjamin's storyteller, but also his um, essay on Kafka. Um, and I think some will remember that uh, Benjamin refers to Scheherazade uh, in the Kafka um, thing saying, uh, the thing that makes Kafka so great, and he says many things make Kafka so great. He says one of the things that makes Kafka so great is that he has a returned uh, or has recaptured or recapitulated um, the storytelling of Scheherazade, right? Which is to forestall the future, right? To, to forestall a sort of coming future catastrophe, which of course is a great theme uh, for, for Benjamin's writing and a great theme of a certain kind of, of sort of critical political tradition uh, in, the, in the West as well. So it's being recovered from this material. And then, of course, in, in Benjamin's Storyteller, we get the idea that the sort of ideal story does not uh, stay the same over time, right? Uh, it intermingles with the work, uh, with the work and the lives of people such that they themselves can then transmit and retell anew. And this is the only way in which, you know, he calls it a community of listeners. Uh, can be bound together. And this is all very, very complicated. And I don't, this is not like all about Benjamin. Um, but it is very fascinating to me that this is a story that like, one of the things that is so fascinating here, right, and this is, a, you've mentioned it, and the text mentions it, right, um, is the amount of embellishment that goes into this in, in sort of classic Saidian Orientalist fashion, right, we have, you know, in the, especially in the French, um, the French editions, however you want to call them. I'll leave that in your hands, Yasmin. Um, uh, but also the amount that the text itself seems to invite this kind of telling and retelling uh, and the sort of uh, political and social critiques sort of seep in. Um, as you mentioned with this frame text, uh, Shahrazad, right? She, she is sudden, like, that is one of the most positive descriptions. You say, it, and it lacks this sort of embodied description, but that is one of the most positive descriptions, as far as I can tell, of almost any character in the text. Um, that sort of early list, right? She is well-read in all these things, and she is wise and clever and all, like, all these things, right? Um, like these seep into the to the storytelling and invite certain kinds of retellings um, that yes, maybe this is not, uh, I love this idea of it being pulp fiction for merchants. Um, and, but maybe that's like not always the worst thing on earth because uh, it does give us, you know, you, you said a principle of recombination and it's, and you also talked about preservation, right? And we do get the preservation of this archive for recombination, right? To retell uh, stories, you know, sometimes for worse, but sometimes, right, uh, for better. And that seems very much in keeping um, both with this ideal of storytelling, I suppose, that we get some, from some of the theoretical sources, but also very much with this kind of like coffee house storytelling that we see that it, I know, you know very well from, from various Middle Eastern uh, regions. Um, 
and that it, we see with the in some of the materials in the annotated edition as being the site of where these stories are being told, right? They're being told in coffee houses in piecemeal fashion with the interjections about um, Shahrazad as the kind of like tune in next week and find out what happens, right? Um, and then finally, so uh, the last thing I think I'll throw on the table here, because I don't want to speak for too long. There's a million things we could talk about, and maybe we'll come back to them. I was sad you skipped the Falcon story, because it is so sad <laughs> and so good. Um, and also the, those animal stories, as mentioned here, that they were incredibly familiar to me. Um, as many of them are adapted from South Asian sources that I remember, that I didn't study, but I actually remember just frankly being told and reading uh, growing up. Um, these sort of magic animal stories that are very relatively rare actually in this text. Um, not, not too much talking animals, not too much, you know, that kind of thing. But in any case, uh, right, the, the final thing uh, I think moves us away from those theoretical sources and back to this text is its weird sort of, I'll call it an alternative cosmopolitanism. Right, um, right. We have in the contemporary and yeah, right. If I think about um, even some of the critical adaptations into the European into European languages, um, some of these persist. Right, as using right the for example my field, political theory, right? Using the example of Oriental, or, or, the phrase Oriental despotism is still used in political comparative politics sometimes, um, right? Like, uh, and it is even when it is being used as an allegory, right? By like, you know, sort of Rousseau types and others in, in the back, back in the day. Um, it, uh, instead we get a version and right versus the cosmopolitanism that is a kind of oh, airy earthless universalism that, that floats above the universe, here we have an alternative cosmopolitanism, I suppose, right? Um, one that is clearly borrowing um, from, again, sources as far away as South Asia and Persia. There's a sort of weird version of China here um, that uh, I have encountered in, in Persian letters many times, right? That is kind of like China just is far. And it's really quite funny if you think about the tradition of Orientalism. It's just far and weird and different and it's over there. Um, but there is this sort of direct, um, direct, there's clearly direct, I mean, just in the name, Shahriyar, Shahrazad, right? Like uh, there's this direct trans trans transmission of Persian works, of, of South Asian works. And then it also gets picked up um, by, um, right, all these European authors, as you mentioned, and then sort of pushed back and retold between European authors and Arabic authors and Turkish authors and so on and so forth. Um, and it does seem to lend itself um, as a kind of wonderful text for this uh, alternative cosmopolitanism that instead of sort of projecting a empty universalism um, is very aware that it is picking up and adapting, I feel, archives that are, you know, on the ground somewhere without saying that it's only that ground uh, that, is, that can legitimately tell them. And, it, and I guess that's where I should stop because you already said so so well that right there's not really one you know I'll use scare quotes right authentic version of this and I'm curious to talk more here what I think everyone else has to say about that as well um because uh to me again that feels so uh liberating in this weird kind of way that there is not you know the master text and there is not the master voice either and that must be uh, strangely comforting uh, for, for both translation and storytelling. So I will pause there. Uh, Rebecca, should. Yeah, so, so I'll pick it up and I'm just going to synthesize a, a few of those comments with, um, uh, with Yasmin's from earlier um, and say that like my first question for you both, um, because form has been such a prominent yeah. Uh, kind of theme in this in this conversation thus far um, is and, and maybe with um, with kind of reference to uh, King Yunnan and the Wise Duban, which is the story that um, that we just heard. Um, you know, what do we make of kind of all of this, like really kind of um, you know tight formal perfection and. and not all the stories possess this, right? Which you've been at pains to, to say it, and I would be at pains to say too, um, but what do we make of this kind of like tight formal, formal perfection next to this kind of unwieldiness, right? This unruliness. Um, I mean, what kind of effect does that, that have on us um, as 
as readers, in what way do we mean this term? Kind of, you know, formal, you know, uh, geometry or formal perfection, um, and also, um, you know, what are the uses of of that? Right? We have the kind of unwieldiness of the of the whole uh, thing, um, in as much as there is a whole thing, but but also, um, you know, the form of of some of these individual tales is so kind of um, lapidary. So I'm really curious to to hear more about form. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, Ajay. Um, there's so much in what you've said. We could have a you know, hundred different conversations just picking up on each of those ideas. Um, but um, yeah, the, the form of this story, I mean, I chose it because there's so much mirroring in the nights and doubling and tripling. You know, there's this kind of mathematics in the nights that's very satisfying when you start to pay attention to it. and um, and what you see a lot is um, a structure where Shahrazad begins a story in which a character interrupts that story to tell his own story so that we're sometimes two or three or four stories deep. And it's sometimes those deepest stories that contain the themes that are of most concern to Shahrazad, themes of male pride and violence and jealousy the stories that directly mirror her own situation are often the most deeply nested. Um, and at, so at the furthest removed from the woman telling them, um, which I sometimes think of as a form of protection, as a form of plausible deniability, you know, within the, the, <laughs> the structure of the work. Um, and this story, the King Yunnan's story is I think one of them, um, you know, she's just telling a story about a fisherman who himself is telling a story to a jinn which happens to contain a kind of parallel situation to the one that she's in. Um, and it's, I wanted to sort of take you into the weeds with one of the, um, one of the phrases because um, this idea of healing or curing from a distance, mm. which keeps coming up, um, which is the source of anxiety, right? That, you know, all this doctor has done is, is cure, <laughs> cure the king of his incurable disease but that power that knowledge rouses a kind of anxiety in him um and the the line in arabic is is um that he he cures him min zahir jasadi which means you know from outside my body um so that line is usually translated as you know this man cured me from outside my body um and i i went with he cured me from a distance um, I suppose because it, um, I mean, I like the line more and I like this idea of, of sort of remote healing. Um, and it seems to connect with narrative and storytelling. You know, this is what we are doing. We're sort of acting on each other by, from a distance by, you know, through using language and, and through telling stories. Um, you know, Shahrazad too is attempting to cure the king from a distance and, and, and is putting her knowledge um, to remedial use. Um, and I suppose this connects with this idea of the mirror for princes. You know, I think it is also a mirror for princes, mm. this work. It's just an unusual one because it's a mirror of prince, it's a mirror for princes that takes place in bed. Um, <laughs> but you know, she is she is playing that role, I think. It's somewhere between the mirror, the mirror for princes and the therapy session. You know, she is. Yeah. She, this is oriental despotism is one way of, of sort of describing what's going on but another is is that this is a a man driven mad by his emotions um and someone has taken on the task of talking him out of that place um that's the kind of basic scenario that's being kind of enacted um and it has the sort of structure of a therapy session, right? It's sort of night after night, the same thing. Um, and, um, and we never seem to really kind of move away from the epicenter, but maybe we can come back to it from a changed perspective. Um, and that circularity feels to me quite modern. Um, the sort of circular structure. It's not, it's not the sort of linear structure of the hero's quest. You know, the person who sets out with a goal and reaches it. It's it's a sort of story about repetition and failure, which feels yeah. um, which feels more feels psychoanalytic. And also, 
I mean, it's particularly true in the cycle of Sinbad. You know, Sinbad is this wonderful story about someone making the same mistakes again and again and again <laughs> and never learning from his mistakes. Um, and I love it for that reason. You know, he's, he's a great hero because the whole story is about, he has everything. He had, you know, he's happy and, and every, every time he leaves his happy life to seek danger and to put himself in danger. So it's also this theme comes up a lot in the nights, you know, why do we, why do we seek things that are bad for us? Um, mm. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's all about the kind of dark side of the mind, I think. Um, which, you know, as you say, Ajay, that, that sort of theme has been, of course, used, you know, often by translators or by, you know, European readers or receivers of this text one way or another to kind of feed um, stereotypes about um, the sort of violence or, or whatever, you know, of the East. But I think these are also just, um, you know, another way of reading the work is that these are, it's a work about anxiety and fantasy. Yeah. Um, and it, it is a work about stereotypes. Um, I mean, it's, it's a work that contains stereotypes, you know, the stereotypes yes. were not, were not inserted. Um, and as you say, there's this kind of contradiction, right? There is a kind of Saidian critique of what various translators have, have done to this text and the embellishments or the redactions, you know, the erasures. Um, but at the same time, it's not a text that invites um, faithful transmission. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so much that I that I want to do to to kind of respond to to all of this. Um, but um, I think I'll, I'll start with what I think I know why uh, Jay was laughing just now. It's because I'm teaching a, a class right now on, on Lauren Berlant's cruel optimism, and and that. Um, was the concept that immediately came to mind when yeah. um, when you were starting to talk about kind of uh, attachment to things that are bad for your flourishing, essentially, right? Um, is that bind of story has this this kind of doubled power, which is quite dangerous in in the text, right? Which is um, uh, as you say, right, that it um, that it can maybe influence from a distance, and that can be. Um, curative or it can be poisonous literally um and um it, there's this kind of um uh like Deridian reading of the Phaedrus, Plato's Phaedrus, which is not like a good reading of the, the Phaedrus, but is really interesting, um, <laughs> uh, where um, where uh, the the kind of concept in play is uh, pharmacon, right? That which both poisons and cures, and it's the written word as opposed to kind of the oral thing um, in in that kind of notion, right? Of um, uh, of, of pharmacon as, as filtered through through Derrida, um, and if this is a story that um, is is in a way about kind of uh, rehabilitation and the endlessness of rehabilitation. Um, it is both kind of melancholic um, and optimistic in the sense of just being about attachment um, in that way as well, it seems to me. Um, because yeah, I mean, right, like if, if story holds out the promise of, of kind of making um, the king less, less violent, right, less kind of, um, uh, controlled, ruled by by his emotions. Uh, it also holds out the the possibility that like that a rehabilitation can never quite be affected, right? Because you have to. The only thing you can do is kind of tread water and keep telling stories and sort of hold out the idea that that maybe this influence works and it works on the king and by extension on like you know right the king's body the body of the state right um, the, <laughs> you know the, the rest of it um which you know is not um necessarily a kind of reading i want to push as like you know this is what it's intended quote unquote to do but is a reading that i think really becomes available if you start thinking in terms of of rehabilitation and what can be rehabilitated and and what do we merely have to kind of create the imaginative forms for so eventually somebody else might be able to to do something with them um right. yeah oh sorry uh rebecca before we leave form and thinking just about what you're saying i mean one of the things that is so fascinating here um especially for thinking about this in terms of what what is optimistic here um yeah. <laughs> uh it the, the right in the one of the tensions that seems to me so present right um 
in this, this question of the adaptations and the translations is this intense desire, at least again, from the, the annotated material and all that stuff, that it seems to be on the, on the part of all these various, um, especially French and, 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 and English uh, translators to want to put a punctum at the end of the story, right? To want to end the story, right? To want to say, and thus, you know, things worked out or, and thus, you know, some, somehow things worked out, right? Um, and one of the most interesting things I think from the sort of maybe more uh, subversive reading that, that I think this, that your translation pushes and that I think is there in the material, as you say, right? Some of the stereotypes and some of the archetypes and whatnot are just there, right? Um, is that it is an unending, right? That it is a constant, uh, to use your language, failure, right? It's about anxiety and failure, right? Um, I don't know about you, but I don't feel like, you know, if the king's an allegory, I don't feel like the king has learned his lesson yet. Um, <laughs> so, so, right, like if there is an optimism in this text and if there is a sort of, especially a political optimism or social and political optimism, it is in its unending nature yeah. and in the demand yeah. to be uh, retold. Sorry, Rebecca, I didn't mean to. I just want to interject that. Mm. Oh yeah, I was yeah. I was co-signing. That's that's exactly I think the right right place to go. Sorry, go ahead, Yasmin. Uh, I mean, the question of the end um, is what I'm thinking about a lot because, you know, I sort of feel like this is a work that doesn't end and shouldn't. Yes, end. precisely. And lots of people have ended it, you know, um, in various ways. I mean, there's there's one ending where, um, Shahrazad. Uh, reveals that she's produced all these children in the time, <laughs> in the time <laughs> she's been, and the king hasn't noticed, you know, she's produced three children. Um, and she says, well, look, these are your heirs. You know, you have to let me live because I've, because I've given you these heirs. And so it, there's this kind of incredibly pathetic ending where- Yeah, that's you know, <laughs> Sorry. You know, the, yeah, like none of the stories have actually had any effect. What's happened is that she has upheld um, succeeded in upholding, you know, the, the sort of status quo, and as a result, she is allowed to live. But then, you know, there are other sort of more more psychological endings where the king reflects on what he's learned and how he's changed, and 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 then Dunya Zad, sort of the sister, pops up from under the bed, and she and the king compare notes on what they've learned from the various stories. Um, and I I kind of like all the different endings, but I but I do feel like. Um, and maybe this is a kind of, you know, this is sort of a very contemporary kind of reading of it, but I do feel that, um, as you say, it's a, the point is the, the process and the sort of endlessness of it. Um, though I was speaking with a, a wonderful German Arabist the other day, Claudia Ott, who translated the Knights into German. And she said, no, no, it does end. It definitely ends. I mean, she's a real <laughs> philologist. <laughs> She, she uh, you know, all my sort of like theories about the endlessness of the text, she was like, no, 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 there are manuscripts and they always end. <laughs> she was saying, you know, every fragment we have um, is part of a work which had an end. Um, the endings are not this kind of European import, you know, the, the works did end and were intended to end. Um, but yeah, again, that's a question of maybe where does the translator when does the where does the translator's role end and the kind of editor's role begin and you know do we have liberty now to edit a version of the nights which doesn't end um i, I mean yeah. all due respect to uh your philologist friend you know I, so, some of my best friends were philologists uh, when i was getting <laughs> when i was in university um but you know one of the things that's so wonderful about this edition uh and again, I don't know who did what, but there's many hands in the pot for this edition. Um, but uh, all the visual material, and in particular, I have to say, I was blown away by the encountering a painter I had not known before, um, who, one of whose paintings is in the bit that, that you skip, but is also up at the front and throughout the text, um, this Dia al-Azawi, uh, an Iraqi modernist uh, painter from the, looks like mid 20th century to late 20th century, or. Yeah. Anyway, he's, he's uh, still alive. sorry, go ahead. He's still alive. Oh, he's still alive. My mm -hmm. bad. Um, and, you know, like whether the 
classical manuscripts had had endings or not, um, clearly this open-ended nature gets picked up, right? Um, in painting, in theater, in cinema, in all these retellings, um, such that that sort of like chain of storytelling is still possible, um, which again, to me is the sort of basis of a kind of, if storytelling is gonna have an effect on consciousness, it must be able to be retold. Um, so even if one can find the, the Ur text or several Ur texts and then compare them, um, it doesn't necessarily quash the, the retelling reading. Right. <laughs> That's a very theory yeah. response to a good philology yeah. Uh, yeah. point. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll, I'll add another one on top of that, right, which is that um, the by nature of the very forms that are used in this text, right, the matryoshka nested structure yes. among them, um, theoretically, um, you can embed stories within stories forever. Right. So regardless of whether kind of stories actually or whether these kind of you know, whether the nights actually ends, right, whether people put endings on that structurally, there is no logical point at which it has to end. Right. It's logic is the logic that, you know, in a Western text, one would call romance. Right. It, it just kind of goes on yeah. episodically. Um, and these things may be kind of thematically related to one another, but there's not anything like a, this kind of like Aristotelian tragic plot that sort of has to have a beginning, middle and and end, right? The principle is that um, how do we make this go on, right? To kind of um, bastardize a bit of Gertrude Stein, right? That writing should go on is 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 the concern right. that that she has. Um, yeah. And speaking of endings and, and endlessness, I just want to mark that we're about ten minutes from our oh. own end, so um, we want to leave about five, I think, at least for for questions. Should there be any? Um, so, um, uh, Yasmin, with with uh, with that out of the way, please do proceed. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd always thought about it as a book without a back cover, but the, the compromise <laughs> I reached with the German philologist was that it <laughs> should have a back cover, but maybe it wouldn't have a spine so that you could keep <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> adding new material between these two covers. Um, sorry, I, I, I want one of those. Love... <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and that, it, you know, as you say, Rebecca, it's also a book that's always um, it's a work that's always leaping off the page and wanting expression in other mediums. Um, I mean, I love those Dia Azawi um, prints as well. Um, that They're was remarkable. Actually, that was my one contribution to the- Oh, to the really? Book. They're fucking like, fantastic, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, no, I, I really I really love them. And, and the, I mean, he was so sort of prolific in his kind of responses to the knights. And I think, I think they're beautiful because they're, they're representational, but they're sort of very dreamlike. And the problem with the knights is always when they've when these characters or these scenarios have been represented, they they're sort of fixed and they become much more about the person doing the representing. Um, they tend to kind of limit what's going on in the text. Whereas Diaz images, I feel, are are real translations of these works in that yeah. they um, they are open. Yeah, um, which is one of the things that that I think if one is going to be moved by by something in the nights, um, that 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 sense of openness, right, or or kind of closure forestalled, to borrow a verb from from you earlier, um, which is as much formal as anything, right? As much formal as as it's about any particular story, um, is that there is something that um, uh, that is moving about that. Um, so I think maybe um, we we have uh, time for for kind of um, just a few sort of um, closing remarks before we we get to Q and A. So um, I don't know. Are there things that um, perhaps um, you, Yasmin, or or you, Ajay, would like us to know about uh, the nights or or your response to the nights um, before we before we turn to audience questions? Um. Well, one thing I might say is that um, uh, this, the texts that feature in this volume represent a kind of compromise or are the result of a kind of compromise between mm. a style I'd been developing and, um, and the demands of the publisher for this particular edition. Um, I'd been playing with a style that was closer to prose poetry um, mm. and that that comes directly out of the experience of reading these texts in Arabic. In Arabic, they are 
unpunctuated, um, which is true of all classical writing. You know, the experience of, of reading these texts is one in which you're just absorbing a kind of flow of language, uninterrupted, unpunctuated, which of course mimics the conceit of the work itself, right? There is no finality, there's no possibility for interruption. Um, and so I wanted to find a form in English that matched that, that conceit and that experience of reading the text in Arabic, one in which each night is a kind of performance um, of uninterrupted speech. It's speech that, that can't be cut short. Um, so I felt that to translate that into sentences and paragraphs um, defeated the purpose. Um, and uh, I wanted sort of each night to be a kind of one, one sort of stream of language. Um, and, uh, and also for, for breath to be the punctuation. So to have sort of white yes. spaces um, to give the eye some relief, but, but for, there no, for there to be no finality within each night and for the rising sun, you know, at the end of each night to be the kind of full stop, if you like, and um, to sort of punctuate the, the text. Um, I wasn't allowed to do that with this volume because for, for various reasons, um, but partly because it's a, it's a work of many parts, as you can see, um, lots of different people involved. And I think the publishers felt that this would not be the right venue to sort of present a kind of formally groundbreaking translation. Mm. Um, and also, you know, it needs to be accessible to as many people as possible. And um, I think, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to make it weird, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm told that, um, that, for the complete nights which is the, the next volume which um will be a bit more sort of uh the work of one person um i will get to present that which i'm excited about because i feel like that that hasn't really been done um uh the sort of musical and rhythmic aspects of the texts are very very important to me um and um yeah stop there Looking forward so much to the, the musical version, to the um, to the weird version. Um, so I'm so I'm so glad that that's in the offing. Ajay, was there there anything you wanted to add, or should we? Oh, just very question? just very briefly. It's funny yeah. that we ended on music because uh, I was going to say the way in which um, and if I under, again I I don't know everything that went into the, the text, only what some of the bits that the text itself talks about putting the text together. <laughs> Um, but the way in which that little refrain of, right, um, but morning gained on Shahrazad and cut her speaking short. The strangest story said her sister, if I live another night, she said, I shall tell you stranger. And then, right, it goes, it, this goes on each time, right? And the king says, okay. And the sister says, you know, when you wake up, tell me another. Um, and how this appears as this kind of, it, it's like your musical version was sneaking out maybe because uh, right uh, if I understand it you you decided to like keep this pattern going far after it uh, it, it it is in those especially those French versions or I, I didn't quite understand maybe how, how it worked um, so that was one sort of question and sort of concluding thing that I thought was so interesting because I was going to want to talk about music and you're like you already sort of did um, and the other is this very interesting relationship, I think, with this text as being sort of, I think it's very obvious the ways in which it gets picked up in romantic traditions. But again, I'll use that um, Azawi painting and these some of these other, and some of your translation choices, frankly, right? That actually show it also has a very, right? Um, you know, romanticism is part of modernism, yada, yada, yada. Um, but right, that there is this kind of way in which it participates also in the construction of a modernist tradition that, you know, is uh, invited, strangely enough, by, and if I mispronounce, it's been a while since I had to, to speak any of these things out loud, but right, the sort of ajib, right, the che ajib, right, how, how wondrous, how strange, right, everything is, um, right, doesn't only invite us, right, to, to fantasy, right, but also to, um, Yes, to these recombinatorial uh, retellings um, that are part and parcel of the modernist tradition, not only of a sort of fantastical and romantic one. Marvelous. Um, 
ordinary and marvelous. Um, yeah. So uh, thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, I'm also really glad we ended on music and the kind of metrical qualities of, of this translation of which I think there are, there are many. Um, so I could, I could spend a whole another hour on prosody at least, but, um, but I won't subject you to, <laughs> to that. Um, so let me go uh, briefly to our, our questions. Um, and here is one. Um, uh, can you speak to the idea of ajaib and what this concept means to the body of work and maybe how ajaib may have worked its way into your discovery as you translate it? This is from Mary Beth Bronk. Thank you. Um, so ajaib, as, as Rebecca said at the beginning, um, these kind of twin or cousin concepts, ajaib and gharaib, Wonder, wonderful, wondrous things and strange things. Um, and it's, it, it's the kind of distinction between them is interesting because hajaib are things that are marvelous. Marvelous can have different meanings, right? It can mean yes. something fantastical. It can mean something that doesn't exist. It can mean, it can mean a sort of wonder of creation, a wonder of nature. Um, so to say that something is ajib might be to express astonishment at the world as we find it um, but it might also be to seek refuge from the world and to escape into a parallel world fantasy world and the knights plays with that distinction yes. I think and I think this story plays with that distinction the story of Duban and Yuna okay. you know this is a story of a man with real knowledge who puts that real knowledge to practical use such that um, he appears to be a kind of sorcerer. Um, you know, it's a story about devices and contraptions. Um, and I think it's not an accident that these stories um, found such fertile ground in 18th century Europe. I mean, Ajay, you were talking about, you know, the sort of rise of the sort of merchant class, the kind of bourgeois reading public, um, Sort of getting a taste for these stories and i think there's a kind of slightly separate point about um you know enlightenment europe yes um a reading public who is thinking about rationality and making yep. a kind of cult of reason also in the same in the same moment becoming obsessed with these stories that are supposedly about the irrational side of life but i think they're i think they might also be understood as stories that show that in fact enchantment is not enchantment and inquiry are kind of um are, are interwoven um enchantment is an aspect of investigation um and knowledge true knowledge of the world um and and there's a whole sort of genre of classical arabic writing um which is which is the genre of ajaib which um, in some ways is a kind of encyclopedism. It's an attempt mm -hmm. to describe the infinite variety of, of the world as it is. Um, but it's also, it might also be the wonders of human imagination. Mm. Um, so descriptions of fantastic beasts, for instance. Um, and sometimes you come across works that include both. <laughs> so you get sort of unicorns alongside um, you know, giraffes. But who's to say that a unicorn is less real than a giraffe in a world where, you know, most people had seen neither. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you get these kind of, in the nights you get similar kind of fantastic geographies where real merchants and sailors accounts of real places, sailors accounts of the Indian Ocean, for example, get blended together with um, dreamlike landscapes and situations the, the only I, oh, sorry ahead, the, yeah. the only thing to add to that um i'm so happy you raised this sort of enlightenment sort of paradigm because i think that is the flip side right of the sort of embellished or ornamented uh, european reception uh that comes through in this translation and this edition so well is that, that uh, right this is also a, a the frame story and many of the sub stories and the sub stories within the stories and so on are in fact about 
uh, Akal, right? There, there are reasoning stories. Um, and I think that this question of a jeeb, right, it, it, right, it can be, it's exactly the way Yasmin put it. And in fact, it's not entirely alien if you look at the tradition of, of, of of science in Europe in that period, right? You get people like Goethe who like, for example, also see a, a, a deep synergy between these kinds of, this kind of wondrousness and, 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 and rational inquiry. And the whole conceit of the text is that Shahrazad will use her reason to, right, to sort of weave these things together. And if it ever works out, right, justice yeah. will be done. Yeah, yeah. And, and the effect of that is sometimes indistinguishable from, from magic. Um, That's right. Is, yeah. the, is, 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 is I think, um, one, of the, one of the kinds of enduring sorts of senses that, uh, that one gets from the text. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, the Enlightenment reception, right, needed an account of, of kind of the, the non-cognitive and the non-rational yeah. in order yeah. to, to kind of undergird, right, yes. the elevation of, of reason. Um, so, so it seems seems very much like um, like there's an attempt in that reception to also put one in service of of the other, um, which is which is fascinating. Um, so I'm just going to look at this this document one more time, and um, we are we are finished with questions. Actually, strangely, okay. so um, I will thank both of you, Jay and, and Yasmin for this conversation, which I, again, I just would love to go on for, for another, um, another interval, but hopefully we can, we can do it again sometime. Um, so uh, again, uh, it's the, the annotated Arabian nights, which is, is Yasmin's new translation of, of selections of, of the nights, um, which is out now. Um, and I am so delighted that we will have more of these to, to look forward to. Um, so thanks to our audience as well. Thank you so much, both of you. Bye-bye.